Wastewater Treatment Plant. I am really very honored and pleased to present just, uh, just the recognition 
recognition of some awards that two of our employees have received. And Dwayne and Tim, if you'd like to come up, that would be great. Um, you know, so many of our employees, especially if you come to town hall and you're paying your taxes or you're applying for a permit or whatever, we, we have a lot of forward-facing employees that you will see. And chances are, if things are going well in the sewer department, you'll never see these guys. But they're the ones who are keeping things running along with a great team down there, as well as our department head, uh, our patron, and our chief operator, Rick Keneally. So the first recognition is to Dwayne Hilfiker. He is the winner of the New York Water Environment Association NIWEA Outstanding Operator of the Year Award. This award is given to a frontline individual who has demonstrated extraordinary dedication to the day-to-day -day operation of a water resource recovery facility. There are seven NIWEA chapters across the state and it is given annually to one operator per chapter. Dwayne has been at the facility for 15 years. He has worked his way up from labor to become a certified operator in 2019. He is a grade 4A certified operator. Uh, this is a direct quote, I believe, from Rick. Dwayne has a thirst for knowledge. He has a wide range of institutional knowledge, but continually asks questions to help build on that knowledge. Dwayne can always be counted on to pitch in and help out whether the help is needed in the lab, plant, or outside maintenance, or just helping the side, keep the sidewalks clear of snow. He is willing to do what it takes to be a team player. Dwayne's mind is always working, looking for ways to improve processes, or maybe just try doing it a different way. Whether it works out or not, he uses the experience and knowledge he gained from the process to make him a better employee. Dwayne, congratulations on receiving that award. Thank you. Lucy Grisano Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship is named after Lucy Grisano, who was a principal administrative assistant in the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. She was a mentor, friend, teacher, and a mother to many operations staff throughout the years. Everyone needs a coach. It is in this spirit that these scholarships are granted in her name. The scholarship is offered each year to one certified operator from each of NIWEA's seven chapters. Tim has been in the industry for 12 years, the last 10 as a certified operator. The first six years for Monroe County, and the last six have been with the town of Webster. He's a grade 3A certified operator. Tim has a can-do attitude. He's always ready and available when handed job tasks or asked to do additional jobs during the workday, and we know the job will be done right. His flexibility allows him to accept new ways to do things and to take on new challenges. He also shows a genuine interest in others and treats others with common courtesy. Tim shows respect, compassion, and empathy for fellow co-workers and works effectively and cooperatively with others. He is the consummate team player and mentor. Tim, congratulations on receiving that scholarship. I want to recognize both of these wonderful gentlemen who are working for the town. And they're just two of the talented and award-worthy employees who are employed at the Walter Bradley Water Pollution and Control Facility. Again, congratulations, guys. Thank you. And next, uh, Pat Stevens, our highway superintendent. Uh, is taking the podium for acknowledging <coughs> our highway department and something pretty special we've had in the last couple of months. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's an honor to get to uh, recognize some of our employees that are out there um, working hard all the time. In fact, right now, uh, most of the individuals we're going to recognize are actually on the roads, so we're not able to uh, be here and stand up here and be acknowledged, but we'll go through the uh, statement of the effort that was made recently. Um, in the aftermath of the Buffalo blizzard that devastated uh, the city of Buffalo uh, in late December, Monroe County towns and villages were called into action by Erie County to assist in snow removal in the city of Buffalo. The town of Webster was able to supply the largest fleet from the Monroe County town with four 10-wheel dump trucks and two front-end loaders. This equipment required 12 operators to run around the clock. The highway department employees working on this effort uh, did so with skill precision and professionalism that is unmatched in the industry. 
the effort provided critical relief to Buffalo residents and allowed them to get back to their day-to-day -day lives. While the efforts were underway in Buffalo, the remaining uh, department staff, led by Foreman John Leckinger, maintained the full operation of the highway department here in Webster. Um, this next bit is, is my comments on, on the effort. Um, the willingness of our highway employees to drop everything and be ready to work at a moment's notice is outstanding. Is one just one of the outstanding qualities that all the members of the department possess. Um, when the call came for this effort uh, to help our neighbors to the west, the response from our employees was exactly that, outstanding. Within 30 minutes, we had 12 staff members ready to go and several alternates waiting in, at the ready. Once the group mobilized to Buffalo, they operated at maximum efficiency for 84 straight hours on alternating shifts, hauling more than 500 loads of stone from city streets. The level of efficiency, this level of efficiency could not have been uh, achieved, uh, would not have been possible without the leadership of Foreman Joe Casper and Joe Merpies, who each organized and ran shifts during the deployment while operating equipment. All the members of the highway department should be extremely proud of this effort. Uh, the actual individuals that uh, went to Buffalo, uh, there was a little more than 12, there was 14. We have Kirk Coddington, Bradley Ferguson, Christopher Hobbs, Dan McKenzie, Joe Maripis, Adam Mer or Andrew Morozak, Chris Snyder, Joe Casper, Matt Mitzek, Howard Parker, Pat Praler, William Thornton, John Fuster, and Jeff Graham. So, outstanding job. Outstanding. It does make you wonder if you get that call the day after Christmas and uh, you're, who answers that call? That's a pretty special group. Pretty special group. Okay. Um, the next uh, section or the next uh, topic is in the open to the floor. The read speaker will be allowed five minutes. Um, and we have a sign-in list. I did see some people that came in late. And if you're, you're open, if you want to speak, we'll have you sign on. Actually, I think there's a second list uh, out there that you can sign on to. And if somebody can bring it up to me, instead of, uh, we'll go with the two list and we'll have whoever signs on late. Can you? There isn't enough. Oh, you know what? It's right here. Arthur? If you don't mind just uh, seeing if anybody in the room is late comers come in. And once again, I said earlier, if we get to your name and you're like, you know, I've decided I don't want to speak, that's fine. By signing in, at least we know that you were considering speaking. <laughs> We won't make you speak if you don't want to. So, um, you know, Charlie, this isn't a formal resolution, but it's like a straw vote. Um, I did watch last week's meeting. Um, you know, I would say the vote of who runs a better meeting, Patty Cataldi or me. I'm going to go Patty Cataldi. I was pretty impressed in that meeting. Take some lessons from you. Right? So, yeah. Um, Thank you, John. I always appreciate the candidness from you. <laughs> the first person on the list, uh, Frank Denunzio. I intended to be here to speak to the board tonight, but I wasn't expecting or intending to be the first one on the list. First of all, I want to thank you for providing the opportunity for us to address the board. Uh, I live immediately north of the highway department parcel, about 300 yards from the salt barn in the main garage. I've been there for nearly 46 years, and throughout that period, uh, I wouldn't have even known that the garage facility was there for, for the most part. Um, it was uh, transparent. Uh, I've reviewed the modernization project documentation that was posted online. And I toured the facility and viewed the area that's being prepared for, for site expansion uh, several times. Uh, you can well imagine being that close to the site that I've got a, uh, a vested interest in how it's being handled and so on. 
after doing so, and especially after uh, viewing the facility firsthand, I have no doubt that the main building is sorely outdated and has outlived its usefulness. Um, current building conditions and congestion do not comprise what I believe to be efficient, safe, and in some cases, minimally acceptable working conditions. I believe collectively they are an ongoing liability risk to the town, the highway department, and the other people that work there. I believe that facility replacement would be the most cost-effective and efficient alternative to address the myriad issues that exist. So I stand before you this evening as a supporter of the proposed facility modernization project. Despite the debt burden posed to the town, or its property tax implications to me personally, mm -hmm. and both of those numbers are non-trivial, I respectfully urge the board to approve the bond act to fully fund the project. I believe that in the long haul, it will serve the town quite well. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jason? Jason Torres. Um, I, I just, I had a bunch of questions about this and I'm, I'm obviously new to these uh, types of meetings and proposals and everything, but um, coming from a pretty new homeowner in the area, we've been here for four years now, um, seeing tax increases like this, especially coming, uh, the proposal coming on the tail end of several other proposals that have approved with tax increases, um, which I think somebody mentioned last week, it's, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Um, I know some people last week had mentioned the Green Initiative too. Um, there's a lot of concern for me in that sense as far as like overloading power grids. I mean, there's been tons of research done as far as how that's disadvantageous to areas, um, especially in light of the fact that the energy <coughs> bills are so high right now. I just, I would like to see some more research into that. Um, I'm kind of a visual learner, so as far as a 50% complete proposal or wherever it's at now, I kind of want to see where all the money is getting allocated to see how it's actually being used. Um, I know in the, um, the bond uh, paperwork that's on the website, it mentioned that you guys did uh, the New York State Environmental Quality uh, check. Um, and then it stated that you guys did publish that to some extent, however required by law. I just, I guess I don't know how to access that, so if somebody could give us easy access to that because I think some of us are probably curious about that um, so I, I believe someone said last week from a legal perspective highway facility bonding votes by the board um, does not require a public hearing of any kind and I guess I'm also confused as that um, being that we are a town and we're supposed to like vote and we are the ones that are paying for this it Without like clarity on the law as far as how that goes, that kind of feels like taxation without representation for me personally. Um, so I guess I kind of want to know like which law or which section I can refer to just to kind of see how that all works for me. Um, I, I did look up a couple of the like local finance laws, so I was trying to figure that out. That's a lot of big words for me, so I apologize. Um, and then I guess I wanted to see if we did want to contest this, and we I did do a little bit of research as well. Um, a lot of the people that I talk to as far as like online, 84% um, of the 70 people that we talked about this with had said that they weren't interested in moving forward with it. So I just, again, want to see where the benefit is to everybody. I don't believe that the board is doing anything nefarious. I just, again, I want to see how all the numbers break down. I did see the facilities and I, I do agree that there do need to be some improvements for sure. It's, it's pretty rough and I, I don't like seeing people working in those kind of conditions, but um, I think we're putting the cart before the horse improving money that we don't even know where it's all going yet. If the, the budget hasn't even been put out there for us to look at. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Jane <coughs> um, Taylor. Thank you. 
I just heard about this, and I know a lot of people who don't who didn't. So I'm wondering how I missed it. It was in my email, or I wouldn't have even known. But I was kind of disappointed because I uh, two years ago, and every year since, I've been trying to get improvements done to the fact that up the upper part of uh, Gravel Road and uh, Clem Road, there is still antiquated septic systems in place. And everywhere around us, in a big circle, everyone has sewers. And so I was trying to get something to done with that, and everyone said, oh, too much money. And then all of a sudden I found out, well, your taxes are going up, $230, and nobody even said anything about this. Um, maybe <clears throat> um, I need to change my news source, I guess. But anyway, uh, I didn't hear. Anyway, uh, the other thing is they talked, I went to a meeting about changing the exit of Gravel Road down to Ridge Road. And I understood that they were going to do something about that. Is that just a different thing? Do you do more than one bond? Like, I don't, I don't know if that's going to be done too, but they sounded like they were planning to do something with that, changing that exit onto uh, Ridge Road, where it just kind of collides into traffic. Um, but uh, I don't know what happened to that. It just sort of didn't, they just had a meeting, and that's all. So um, I don't know if uh, there's some way that this could get out more frequently or to a, in a better way than email. I mean, my, I don't know about you, but my email is buried every day with all kinds of stuff. Every time I buy something online or if I try to talk to someone, it, I just get 30 emails from every, from every company and all their subsidiaries, they just send everything in there until my email is just buried. And, and to notice something in email is, is, uh, <coughs> is kind of hard, so. Uh, the, the runoff in our area is not, has not been dealt with. It, 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 it floods every spring, thankfully. It's all marsh up there, and, and there's no reason, because it just has to be redirected, and, and it's also partly because all the, all the buildings in the area are dumping all their wastewater into, their, into the ground. So um, nothing has been done to treat that. And uh, so I, I kind of put that on a higher priority than this, but it, you know, I haven't been to the facility, I admit it, um, because I, like it was just news to me. So um, I'm gonna have to turn on Channel 8 News, I guess, it looks like. All right, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Ken Corpus. <laughs> new storm 
water treatment facility, improvements to the main building, and a fuel island. There's still no dollar amount associated with those. Um, also, um, the amount of money that you're going after for the bond is $188,000 more than the total that you came up with for the project. And I'm just curious what that money is going to be used for. Also, it mentions the highway department generates between $800,000 and a million dollars a year in revenue for the town, which they've done so probably for 20 or more years. It's a lot of money. And it would have been nice to see maybe that money to used to defray the cost to the taxpayers. And you're going to take out a bond for this for 30 years, but let's be honest, it's not really a bond, right? It's additional tax. And I say that because after 30 years, the amount that's going towards that bond is not going to come off the tax rolls. Just like the two bonds that are supposed to come off now, the million dollars to purchase land for the Sandbar Park and the library bond. <clears throat> when those come off, I don't see the budget going down any. So this is literally a tax increase. Um, so if I could take a minute, I'd like to do a little role today. Let's pretend that the board is planning on building a house. And everyone else in this room is the bank. And you are applying for a home mortgage. But you only have 50% of the plan completed. So who in this room would like to give them the money for their house to build with only 50% of the plan completed? Okay. So that's what's happening here. We have 50% of the plan completed, and you're going to spend $28 million. And I know I've said it before. I'm here because I have an 88-year-old mother that's living on a very low fixed income. And these increases eat away at what she's making. And... I'd like to see some more detail before I could say if I was for or against it, because right now I'm kind of in the middle of the road. So you had 44 million in the sewer project, 28 million in the highway department, 11 million in the sandbar park project without a restaurant, probably a million for the comprehensive plan, three million for the Vosburgh pump station, and if you include your proposal for an ambulance district, about another million there. That's $88 million, and that's all extra tax money. So even though you say it might be $100 a year, most houses are worth more than $200,000, so I think the average homeowner is going to see more than that. Um, and as I said before, I mean, I just would like to see more details. I don't know why there was, I mean, you did a great job putting the pictures together and everything, and I think that, but there's just not enough line item detail in the budget. Because if I was sitting where you were and I wanted to vote on this, I don't know that I would vote for it. It's just, just for that reason. So, have a good night. Thank Thanks, you. Ken. Tony Hubbard. Good evening, and thanks for inviting us. Uh, I've lived in Webster now for over 50 years. I met a, a girl who was teaching at uh, Spry, I used to call it junior high, and, and, and so I've been here ever since then. I've seen a lot of growth in the town over those 50 years. Um, I think 104 was maybe just coming in through Webster, or, or was about to. So there's been a lot of growth, population, and um, I did have the opportunity to review the, to visit the site on Monday night, and um, it's obvious that it really needs upgrading, replacement, it's not really adequate for the, the people or the equipment that we have. And um, I, I would urge you to vote for it, for approval. Maybe it needs some more work, some uh, finishing touches, uh, according to the last speaker. Um, and I think it's important, too, to consider other revenue sources, such as state, federal, and possibly even county funding, and to keep it as low as possible to the, for the tax burden. But I think. Um, it's sorely needed, and I encourage you to continue your work with it uh, for eventual approval and upgrade of the facility. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And the last person I have, unless somebody else came in and wants to sign in, is Brian Nesbitt. Brian Nesbitt. And for anybody new to Webster, 
Rand is the previous town supervisor. Thank you for that. Right off the bat, I would like to state that back in 2018-2019, myself, Joe Herbst, and the current town attorney had conversations with the county finance and the owner, owner of the property to the north about purchasing the property to enlarge and build a new highway garage. So I'm not against the fact that we should build a new highway garage. It's been needed for a long, long time. So this wasn't a new idea by the current administration in 2020 to build a new highway garage. The previous administration had already started the ball on that. <clears throat> in fact, Joe Herbst left two binders of information of his 40 years of experience at the highway and what he thought should be in, included in a new highway garage for the new highway superintendent. It's also been about five years to get this, it's been also been five years to get this far in the design of 50% of the new building. And I question why this town board is not waiting until 100% of the design is done before going out to bid and bonding this project. By your own admission, this town board up to this point hasn't looked into green energy while 50% of the design is finished. You're going to look at green energy in the May-June time frame after you bond $28 million for this project tonight. What happens at the May-June time frame, you find that doing some sort of green energy might bring a return on investment to Webster residents. Where are you then going to get the funds if you've already bonded $28 million tonight? High, Running Point Highway has solar panels on the top of their building, as you can see as you pass the building coming into Webster. And they must have thought a return on investment for their residents. Why doesn't this town board feel the same, I ask? All of you have been to Liberty Lodge, and that construction has piping in the floor and the sidewalk to keep the floor warm at a constant temperature and allows for no shoveling of the sidewalk. Did we look at this technology in this new $28 million building to keep the warm for is warm and reduce the gas cost. So let's face it, the vote tonight will be 5-0 with very little discussion about the tax implications to 16,500 parcel parcels that will pay this bond for the next 30 years. This town board will be bonding at least 83 million in the past in the next year, putting Webster residents in big debt for 30 years. Using 50 cents per thousand, the town board is using for this 28 million. If you include the 44 million and 11 million for San Mark Park, residents of Webster will be paying over $300 per year for the next 30 years in taxes and sewer fees. If my numbers are wrong, I'm open to corrections from this town board at any time. And I think the residents would like to understand how much debt we are going into the future on all three projects. But I'm sure there are members of this town board tonight that have absolutely no clue on what this $83 million is going to totally cost residents and couldn't give us an answer if I pulled each one of you. Webster is made up of 40 seniors, and this town board also represents them. And you just put them in debt for the next 30 years while they struggle to meet, to meet current economy needs. It's time to slow down the spending and wait until you have all the information and the design plans finished before you go out to bonding. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> and was there anybody else that came in that wanted to speak? Okay. Um, so that concludes the open to the floor. Um, the next item up, <coughs> and it's funny, it's only 20 words, resolution to authorize the issuance of 28,250,000 serial bonds to finance the construction and reconstruction of the new time of the garage facility located at 1,005 Picture Parkway. 
I don't know, what does that take me about six seconds to read that? Um, so before we vote on that, because it is a serious thing, it's a, it's a seminal moment in this town's history. Uh, the last one of these that was built was 54 years ago. Uh, my guess is, except for maybe Wayne's uh, family back there, some of the younger ones, none of us will be around when another one is built. These are 50-year-old things. Um, so I do want to get some comments and some just filling in some of the questions that were asked on the public podium. And unfortunately, um, two of the people that spoke, Mr. Corpus and Mr. Nesbitt, have now left. Um, and I don't know, I know Mr. Corpus was here last week, so a lot of what he said tonight was answered last week at the meeting by our town engineer, Mary Harrington. Um, Unfortunately, he had left before she had her comments. So right. He didn't get a chance to hear those. Which is, and that is unfortunate because, you know, one thing I feel pretty confident about this board and our department heads is that we will answer any question that is put forth to us. In fact, I have, a little, I have my business card here uh, for you, Mr. Torres, uh, and on the back, I want you to email me all the things that you reference at the podium so I can point you in the right direction to get the answers to all of those things. Um, for expediency's sake, tonight, uh, we're not going to answer all the specific things. Um, Ms. Taylor, most of what you asked was about the septic system in the sewer and gravel. We happen to have the sewer department here. Would Rick or Art, could you get your information over to Ms. Taylor? Because I know that, that you've done the thing over on gravel and it's you got to have 50% plus interested and you didn't get that a couple years ago. My guess is Ms. Taylor was one of the ones interested in you can update her on that offline. Um, so, before I hand it off to anybody at this dais to talk, comment, question, before we put forth a very serious vote, I was not here last week. I watched Mary Harrington, our town engineer, um, give a narrative of the seven minute virtual tour of the highway facility. Um, over 3,000 people in the last two months have taken that virtual tour. 3,000 people. Um, many people have taken the actual in-person tour. And Pat, I'll hand this off to you in a little bit. People that came into that in-person tour, very skeptical, very cynical, maybe very like, what are we doing? Took the 30-minute tour, saw it, and saw the reasons why this project is so important. Um, Mary's narrative last week, which you can go to our website and look up the town board meeting from last week and go to about, I don't know, 30 minutes into it. She did a phenomenal job. In hindsight, we should have probably had her narrate that instead of having music behind it. Um, she did a great job. Um, later on in the meeting last week, uh, there was discussion about the 50% design. I'm not going to get too much into that. Mary said it, but I'm going to hand that off, and I'm sure Councilman Abbott, who is an engineer, can give some more color to the 50% design and how that might not be as big of an issue as some people made it out to today. Well, when you get this 50% design, it's the building itself. It's not the cabinets, it's not the chairs, it's not the tables that are going to go in the building. The, the, the building structure itself isn't going to change past 50%. It's what it is. And that's what we're basing the costs on, is what that building is going to be. We've made allotment for incidentals and that in the, in the budget, but it's when you get to 50% design, that's what the building is. The structure is done, there it is on paper. Um, you might have a few walls, petition walls that have to be put in, depending on how things work out with place, placing chairs and desks in office spaces. But beyond that, that, that building at 50% won't be any different than it is at 100%. They can, the takeoffs that, that were done can be completed at 50% without at, for, for a preliminary budget, which, what, which is what this board all saw. So it, it, should, it shouldn't be an issue as far as I'm concerned, yeah. versus 50% or 100%. And, and Bill, Mary did a great job explaining how this building, and not to this is not as complex a building as like a sewer plant that has no. blowers and technical aspects. 
it, it's uh, and we MRB and I mean our engineers they have done this in Cicero they have done this in Clarence so I I, I don't I agree with you and I the fifty percent is not something that should hold us back from moving forward um, I got to tell you this um, I think that the communication strategy that has been deployed in the last six to 12 months to try to take 45,000 plus citizens of this town to let them know this was going on is an unprecedented effort in this town. Now, Ms. Taylor, you said you got an email out of nowhere. Email was one of about 12 different uh, conduits of communication that we used on this in the last six to 12 months. And most recently, in the last 45 days, we really amped it up um, as we did promoting the tours. Just to give you a little flavor, um, our website has had many posts on this. Our weekly newsletter that Karen does has had much information. Social media posts, board meeting presentations. Pat, you've been a frequent flyer here. You've gotten so popular that the TV stations wanted you to do because they, you know, you, I have a face for radio, you have a face for TV. I've done several newspaper articles on this. I'm an accountant, I'm not a good writer, but I've written many, I'd say many, three or four articles in the last six months on this. 3,000 people have taken the virtual tour. Seven minutes. And, and Karen can figure out that they watched the whole this seven minutes. 45,000 people. Okay. I beg your pardon? 45,000 people. 45,000 citizens. Are going to be affected? Yeah. And 3,000? The, the public speaking is done. Thank you, Mr. Right, Mr. Right. <laughs> I was just clear. We had the, the tours that will continue, live tours. And I think it's kind of sad, and this is just, I don't want to put a, a you know, editorializing on this. We're in a world, unfortunately, where keyboard warriors, it's easy to just getting off your hump and getting in and taking a half an hour tour to really get educated. I've been disappointed with how many people have actually done it. Um, some of the people that have given cons on this, uh, 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 that were here tonight and last week, I'm assuming they did not go and take the tour. Is that correct, Pat? Not correct. I think they actually stayed at that at some point. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's easier to type and talk than it is to actually act. Um, we had this written up in the quarterly Webster Today magazine. If you live here in Webster, that is the Old Town Times. It's been revamped in the last three years, and we get a lot of great feedback that people actually get it, read it. Um, we handed out 2,000 information sheets, about the size of an eight and a half by 11, during the month of January because people stream into the town hall to pay their county and uh, town taxes. And when they got their receipt for their county and town taxes, they got stapled to it an information sheet that told them about this project. 2,000 people got it. We also had three billboards that were at our main public facing uh, places in, in town uh, for government, town hall, uh, the library, and the rec center. They have QR codes and they say highway project, they're right at the reception desk. I could go on and on. The interesting thing is, is that through that effort, we did get a lot of feedback. And it was good feedback. It really was. Um, so I don't want people to think that, oh, all of a sudden, you know, in the last two weeks we're trying to jam this in and workshops and all that. Because that's just simply not the truth. <coughs> So with that being said, um, like I said, before any type of uh, resolution is, is proposed, I think it is serious enough. I've done enough lip flapping on this. Um, Jenny, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> what, what comments, questions do you have on this before we offer this up as a proposed resolution? Well, like I said last week, no one likes to borrow money or to, you know, raise taxes or anything like that to our community. But we have to look toward our future. And you have to spend money 
to make money. And these facilities and all the um, things that we have coming is to improve our community and to um, help the next generations and everything else. Because if you own houses, you know that you have to take care of your house. And if you let it decrypt and you don't take care of it, years pass and this is what's going to happen. You're going to spend more money. When you pass and gone away, the next generation is going to want to pay for that. I don't want to see that. I wanted to see, you know, we, get, we live in a community where we think about future, we think about family, we think of, you know, what could be better for us. And it, it's hard to say, you know, this is, yeah, it, it's a lot of money, but we are going to look into grants, we're going to try to, I know that the, the environmental bond uh, act had passed in November, but, you know, for $3 billion. And we can look into it and to see if we can, you know, get some of those grants, you know, for our sewer department and other grants, you know, for our highway department and, um, you know, other things that we are planning to do for the future. Thanks. Paul, from a finance director standpoint, is there anything you heard or heard tonight or heard last week or some of the comments that have come in that you and opine on? Well, I mean, there's a lot of concern with the tax rate for sure. Uh, as you said in previous meetings, when you isolate this project, you're going to have about 50 cents per thousand. Obviously, there are several other projects that are, look like they're going to take place. And uh, yeah, I mean, the tax rates will be going up. Uh, that's why we're going to do all we can to secure grants to minimize that. We do have healthy surplus. Um, we can use that surplus as a revenue in certain years to minimize the cost. So I would think over the next few years, this is a, a great time to start utilizing those funds that were put, put away over, over many years in the past. And, and you know, it's <coughs> funny, Paul, when I watched the video of last week's uh, meeting, after the part about the highway garage, facility was done. And he went on to the regular uh, agenda items, budget transfers, closing out capital projects. <coughs> you know, coincidentally, three of the next resolutions had aspects that each of those items had grants. That's correct. It's one thing for a, an organization to say, we're going to apply and maximize our ability to get grants. It's another thing to show that our past history is, we are getting these grants. Yeah. So, and as we've said in many of our communications, unfortunately, you can't apply for to the federal government, to the state government, to the county, to anybody who gives grants for projects like this, and say, hey, we're applying for a grant. If you give it to us, well, then we're going to move on to the town board bonding it and doing design and doing bids and all that. That's not how it works. You have to show those agencies that you are serious about doing the project and that you've committed to doing the project. Um, it's as simple as that. Right. So, um, thanks, Paul. Yeah. Well, if you yeah. know, 28.5 million, we don't necessarily have to spend all of it. Is, yeah. that, is, is that correct or not? Right, John, I was just gonna say, uh, just because we're bonding, you're actually required to bond, uh, which you believe full cost of the project is going to be, which is definitely based on engineer assessment. You're required to find that full amount, even though know, bids can come up much lower, you might get grants to reduce the cost, you might use surplus to reduce the cost. Um, there's, there's a lot to you need for our full amount. So I don't think it's necessarily going to cost you. No. Oh, okay. I had taken a tour a number of years ago with our friend Joe Herbst. And um, again, to a, a, a tour with Pat last week, and um, you know, the presentation, the visual presentations were great with all the pictures, but it doesn't hold a candle to actually going to the site, walking through the buildings, actually physically walking in the locker room, and visualizing how do 40 people fit in this locker room? It, it, you have 40 people trying to punch in 
and, and I was like, my pet, you might want to consider taking a picture of 40 people in the kitchen, the cafeteria area, and 40 people trying to punch in. And when you walk down the line in, the, in the, one building where the trucks are, you can't walk straight. You're walking between the trucks like this because there's absolutely no room. And um, I just visualize, you know, our employees having to work in those conditions for all these years, and you know, keeping that building as well as they do. And the, the, the one thing that really stuck out in my mind was as I walked through these buildings. The cleanliness of the building and the vehicles was amazing. It reminded me of when I worked for UPS and they washed their vehicles every single night. And if you notice, when you see our trucks on the road, they're they're clean. They do they take such pride in everything they do. You know, I know this is a lot of money, but my gosh, if anybody deserves it, it's our employees in high regard, in my opinion. Hey, I'm going to put you last, by the way, okay, if you don't mind. Um, Bill, do you have any, any? Well, John pretty well spelled it out. I've walked through that building so many times, it scared me to see the conditions we've made our people work in. Joe and I talked about it years ago, when I was liaison at that time, and Joe was superintendent. Then Patty was liaison for a while, and now I'm back as liaison. And the one thing I wanted to make sure I got done was to get this project off the ground. Um, it's sorely needed. I know it's a lot of money, $28 million is a lot of money. But to push it down the road any farther, $28 million might turn into $35 million. We can't afford to keep going down the road. We need to just step up, do it, bite the bullet as a down board, and do the right thing for our people. Eddie? Uh, well, I concur with what everyone here at the board table has said. Um, we need to do the right thing, not only for our highway employees, but the people who live in this town. And to continue to provide the services, this is something that's really necessary. None of us likes to raise taxes. None of us. And we do our level best to keep that to a minimum. There were a couple of things said last week, and they were said again tonight, but I just want to clarify. One is that there was a estimated $1 million for the comprehensive plan. I have no idea where that number came from. I believe we looked at it as approximately $150. Josh, is it $150? Thank you for doing that. Okay. <laughs> so it's $150,000 plus we received $100,000 in grants to offset right. that cost. So I want to set the record straight on that. The other was, uh, it was mentioned twice by our former town supervisor and and Mr. Corpus, and he mentioned it last week also, $11 million for Santa Barbara Park. How much do we get in grants for that? Five? I think we're under five million. And we actually we found it nine and a half. To offset that. Yeah. So, you know, it's easy to stand up and throw out numbers, but sometimes I wonder just where they're coming yeah. from. So I wanted to clear the air on that. As far as the 50%, thank you, Bill. And I think that Mary did a tremendous job of explaining that mm -hmm. last week. Yeah. Um, and to me, if we're going to go with, okay, we're building a house and we're applying for the mortgage, um, if you're going to build a house, you know you're going to have to put in a lawn, and you know that's going to cost you whatever, 8000 perhaps. You've got it in the budget, you just haven't picked out the grass seed yet. So you know you're going to have to do window treatments, you know it's going to cost whatever it is. You factor that in, but you haven't picked out the drapes yet. And that's the same thing with the highway garage. We know we have to put furniture in. We know we're going to need some appliances. That's factored into the budget. We just haven't picked them out yet. We haven't picked out the tile. So that's what 50% means. Um, that really doesn't bother me at all. We've looked at many projects, and that's pretty much what we'll base all our projects on when we consider the cost of what we want to buy. Um, I totally agree with everyone here that this is something that is very much needed. And by waiting, future cost of this project scares the daylights out of me. We can't continue to, continue to push this off any longer. Can I make a factual comment? You, this, yeah, this, Charlie, this, you this, come this, on. I'm not voting member. This is not in favor or against <laughs> anything. But I, I've seen over and over and heard over and over about the comment uh, regarding the 
taxability and how it's going to affect uh, each of the homeowners with an average cost or an average value of homes in Webster being $200,000. The fact of the matter is that the average home in Webster, under our current taxation, which is at a 64% equalized rate, is actually under 200000 in the town of Webster. Um, and that's what you're taxed on. You're not taxed on the marketability or on the market value of your home. You're taxed on the assessed value of your home. I just want you to know that because I represent the Board of Assessment Review and the Assessor and often see these values come in. So, that's been bandied about quite a bit, um, I think, in error, and I think people should know exactly what it's going to cost. It will be based on your assessment, not on your actual market value. Again, is the average assessed value of a home in the town of Webster is more than $200,000. And I'm glad you brought that up because words matter. I know in the FAQs, and I it was in the supervisor's corner article this week, the average home at the current equalization rate. Maybe to the average person they saw that and they don't know what, thank you for giving color on that. The average, you might sell your home for $300,000, but that means that it's probably assessed for under $200,000. Correct. That's correct. Very important uh, clarification. Public state is over. I think, please, Art, make sure you get the information so Ms. Taylor can talk to you about the sewers and the septic over on um, gravel. Um, before I do hand it off to you, Pat, you'll bring up the rear before I make this motion. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that this is a step in the process, a very important step in the process to show that the town board, if they vote, it's a super majority. If this ends up being three to two, that doesn't pass. It's got to be at least four to one on something like this. Um, that will lead to Mary as the town engineer, Jared, you're here from campus tonight, Pat. The team will put together the final pieces of the resolution, what is it, request for bid. Um, and then based on municipal uh, bidding laws, Wix law, whatever, I think there's five different construction contracts that, you're, that will be bid out. Is that right, Pat? Yeah. All right. Um, when that goes out to bid, it's got to be properly advertised and everything by the law. And then when the bids come back in, the Honorable Dolly McGuire, at a, right down here, right Dolly, will open those sealed bids. And really when that happens, if the low bid on those five um, different contracts, if the low bid on those five different things aggregates up to under, I think, 23 2.7 million because this project 22.7 million of it is the budget for those five construction bids we're going to know probably in five months less than five months based on the timeline of the next action steps what those bids will come in at i think it's important for people to understand that because just because the board is making that commitment tonight that doesn't mean that Paul is going to go out tomorrow and ask the bank for $28 million. Correct? Correct. It's well down the road. It's well down the road because what could happen is that those bids come in for an aggregate of $19 million. And so we're already $3 million ahead, $4 million ahead. And I would like to think the way Campus and MRB and Pat and Mary and Bill have done this, it's, it's somewhat of a conservative estimate because to me, the worst thing you can do is pander to people and come in, let's try to, let's do this at 23 million, that's more palatable, and then we'll just, you know, we'll sell them later on when it's 27 million. That's deplorable to do. So we're, I think we're doing this conservative. I think there's signs in the market that some of the uh, inflation is starting to subside, that monetary uh, fiscal policy of the federal government is starting to slow. So we'll know. Let's not speculate, but we're going to know in a couple months what those bids can be. I wish Mary was here today, but I think, Bill, you can speak to this better than anybody maybe uh, from the years you were in here. The, the soft cost, or you know, as uh, somebody said last week, the slush fund, but Mary explained it in great detail what it was. Um, at the end of the day, that's still time and materials, right? It's a combination of time and materials and actual bids that we have. Right. Engineering costs are in that. We already have that contract. 
But then once we get into the construction phase where there's estimates on that, you get into some time and materials, and I've seen from the way this town manages those things, I feel very good about the team we have, that we won't go over budget on those things. So, anyway, um, like I said at the beginning, it took me six seconds to read what that resolution is, and it's probably thousands of personnel hours and our team of, of uh, outside uh, suppliers, contractors, that have worked on this the last 12 months to get to this point. And this is really, uh, what did Churchill say? This is not the beginning of the end, this is the end of the beginning. Was he the one that said that? Yes. Yeah, I guess I call it that. Um, so before I read it, Pat, since you are the one burning the midnight oil and doing tours and doing this and that and TV spots and whatever, we'll give you the last uh, shot at the microphone before we uh, make the motion. Sure. I'm going to try to keep it pretty short. You're right. I've been here a lot talking about this project. I do a lot of talking as we go through the tours. It is great to have people in here. We do wish uh, more folks would come out and uh, visit us to see things firsthand. John um, did it on the head. You really can't describe it. Get the picture. You know, it may say a thousand birds, but apparently, you know, um, viewing it yourself speaks 10,000 because uh, it's, it's dramatically different from person uh, and, and our employees working it every single day. So I think it's important for the public to know that. Um, we, we've been at it since July. Last July is when I first came here and did the first presentation. A uh, piece of paper I picked up on this war back in, in 2018 from Joe Herbst discussing this topic. Bill mentioned last week it's been over a decade. The topic's been discussed. Um, we're moving along through the process. So I've been here talking a lot. To try to Minimize that. I was going to hit on a couple of things that have come up during the tours uh, with actual interaction with residents and different things. Um, and one of the biggest ones, not surprisingly, but uh, as we talk about the budget and go through the facility and I talk about the steps moving forward um, and the impact of the bomb, we have multiple questions. Uh, and we touched on it earlier here with the revenues and different things, but it's um, we have to bond the entire amount. There was no uh, nothing put away, you know, funds or different things. I, I know Paul alludes that we, we have a general fund, um, but there's been a consistent call for planning, planning moving forward, more forethought. Uh, you know, the next time this does happen, which I agree, it's probably going to be after we're all uh, long gone from uh, this place in one way or another, what's being done. And, and I was very happy to be able to answer them because it's come up to the board several times. Um, but this board is, is very, very interested in not having a situation come up again in the future. Uh, and there, there is planning efforts already uh, begun on uh, future spending and, and establishing um, funds for various things for these facilities age out, which we do not have right now, which is why we're looking at bonding the entire budgets for these projects instead of having uh, set aside funds perhaps or maybe some other things uh, to, to curb the cost of this. So that had come up several times. Um, and the concept and some of the call, uh, why aren't we waiting? Um, Mary did it perfectly, amazingly, and I wasn't able to be here, but I watched it and I was, couldn't be happier the way she answered the 50% plans and different things like that. The number one thing that will affect the ability to bring this in on this budget, which is dramatically higher than it would have been five or 10 years ago, uh, there's nothing we can do about that now. But this board has the opportunity now to not have it happen again, and it's waiting. So the call, to wait till this happens, wait till that happens. So if we alter the schedule on this right now, where the market is, even a month, it can cost thousands, if not millions of dollars more. Uh, easily within a year, it could be millions uh, of additional dollars. And Patty touched on it, that that is the, uh, the scariest part. It is for me too. So for this step to happen, and then the, the sequence that we have is critical. Um, I mentioned in some of my presentations, even keeping on the path we are now to uh, continue doing our grant research, but have our goal to be to go to bid in June. We don't get into that building until 2025. Um, we really hope the building stays in the condition it is until then. We don't know that. That's a long time. A two-year uh, construction time for a facility, a facility like this is critical. Um, so really keeping this on schedule, the schedule that we've developed uh, to get it to bid and get it constructed, is the number one thing that will save taxpayers money. Uh, to not do that is will cost them greatly in the future. Uh, eventually we will have a failure and at that point. Uh, it'll be dramatically more expensive. We'll have relocation costs. 
um, equipment damage, you, you name it, that will occur, um, and God forbid, injuries. So, um, this is the path in the most critical part of the planet is to stay on the schedule. So, All righty. Well, we just spent a half an hour since the open to the mic, so I, uh, but I think it deserved that. So, I'm just running to, to make the motion with it. Without further ado, unless anybody else has anything to say at the dais here, uh, I'm going to make a motion that the town board of the town of Webster, Monroe County, New York, the town authorizing the construction and reconstruction of a new town highway department facility, stating the maximum estimated cost thereof is $28,250,000, appropriating said amount, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of up to $28,250,000 in serial bonds of the town to finance said appropriation. At a regular meeting of the Webster Town Board, the Town of Webster, Monroe County, New York, held at the Town Board meeting room at 1002 Ridge Road, Webster, New York, on the 23rd day of February, 2023. Uh, those present were Supervisor of Town 30, Councilman Bill Abbott, Councilman John Cahill, Councilwoman and Deputy Supervisor Peggy Cataldi, and Councilwoman Jane Wynn. The following resolution is offered by the town supervisor and moved uh, into adoption. Whereas the town board, the town of Webster, proposes to authorize the issuance of $28,250,000 in serial bonds of the town to finance the construction and reconstruction of a new town highway department facility and then town owned parcels of land in Webster, New York, and in and for the town of Webster, Monroe County, New York, at 1005 Picture Parkway. Tax parcel numbers 079.07-1-10 and 064.19-2 201 and to the demolition of the town's existing highway department structure, the project at an estimated cost of $28,250,000 and whereas by resolutions adopted on December 15, 2022, the town board determined that actions to be undertaken in connection with the project collectively, the action constituted a type one action pursuant to the provisions of the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act and regulations promulgated there under. The town board assumed lead agency status for the purposes of conducting a coordinated review of the action in accordance with Seeger. And three, the town board determined that action will not result in any significant adverse environmental impacts adopted a negative declaration pursuant to Seeker with respect thereto and directed that a notice of negative declaration be filed and published to the extent required under Seeker. And whereas the town board now wishes to appropriate funds for the project and to authorize the issuance of the town's serial bonds and bond anticipation notes to be issued to finance the aforementioned specific object or purpose. Now therefore be it resolved, serial bonds of the town, the principal amount of $28,250,000 are hereby authorized to be issued pursuant to the provisions of the local finance law, constituting <coughs> Chapter 33A of the Consolidated Laws of the State of New York, to finance the aforementioned class object or purpose. The town supervisor is hereby further authorized to take such actions and execute such documents as may be necessary to ensure continued status of the interest on the bonds authorized by this resolution and any notes being issued in anticipation thereof. The resolution shall take effect 30 days after the date of its ado adoption or if within such 30 day period there is filed with the town clerk a petition subscribed and acknowledged by a number of qualified electors of the town required by section 91 of town law and in the manner specified in such section until approved by affirmative vote of a majority of such qualified electors voting on a proposition for its approval. Upon this resolution becoming effective, the town clerk is hereby authorized and directed to cause a copy of this resolution or summary thereof to be published together with a notice attached and substantially the form as prescribed in section 81.00 of the law in the official newspapers of the town for such purpose together with a notice of the town clerk substantially the form provided in section 81.00 of the law. That is my motion. Second. 
Supervisor Clarity? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilwoman Capaldi? Aye. Councilman Kaya? Aye. Councilwoman Wendy? Aye. And that is the end of the beginning. Well, and I will say that yes, this vote was five nothing, but it was with careful consideration and certainly much discussion. <clears throat> You're still there, Joe. Do you remember when I first came into your office, like two weeks after I got elected and I wanted to sit down and get briefed by you? Remember the first thing you hit me with? Mm -hmm. You got to get this highway garage built. <laughs> and I'm gone, and you're still here. That's right. <laughs> I have an effect on you. <laughs> All right, well, um, what do you think, Josh and uh, Jim? You want to? Sure. Yeah. You might be interested in this presentation. It's called property maintenance. Mm -hmm. It would find it ironic that a lot of the highway guys were going to come tonight, but they're out long. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs>
Um, New York 101, and the title of the property maintenance code, and the reason why I'm using the property maintenance code is what we're kind of looking at tonight, but this is also included in all of those books. It just has a, the only difference in the wording is where it says property maintenance code, it says whatever the book title is. It says this publication uh, shall be known as the 2020 edition of the property maintenance code of New York State, hereafter referred to as this code. This code is part of the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, or the Uniform Code. 103.1, Administration and Enforcement, says the Uniform Code shall be administered and enforced by the authority having jurisdiction. The identity of the authority having jurisdiction is given in any given situation is termed in accordance with Article 18 of the Executive Law and the regulations prog uh, proclamated by the Secretary of State pursuant to the Executive Law Section 31, or sorry, 381. In general, the authority having jurisdiction is the local government, city, town, village in which the building or structure is located, in our case, the Webster and myself in the building department in the uh, fire marshal. So 10311, where a city, town, or village, or county of the authority have in jurisdiction, such city, town, or village, or county shall provide for the administration and enforcement of the uniform code and energy code by local laws, ordinances, or other appropriate regulations or combination of both. So basically what this is saying is um, you can choose to put municipal law, or I'm sorry, other codes into the municipal law to back up these codes, but whether you choose to do so or not, they are, you do, we do need to enforce them. Um, this is another continuation of the last slide. Um, this is from a legal memorandum um, that was issued back in April of 2021. What elected officials need to know. Um, and A says the uniform code, or the title is the uniform code, an individual city, town, village is not required to adopt the or take any other affirmative steps to make the Uniform code, code effective within the municipality, the Uniform Code is automatically in effect in each city, town, or village in the state, except for New York City, by directive of the state legislator. And in, in an individual city, town, or village cannot choose to exclude itself from all or any parts of the Uniform Code. So it's basically backing up what I just said. Whether we choose to adapt it into our municipal law or not, we have got to enforce it. We don't have a choice. Article 18, Section 371, Statement of Legislative Findings and Purpose, which is on the top right uh, blue square of the screen, to, uh, number five says, provide protection to both residential and non-residential buildings and ensure the, the uniform code to be in full force and effect in every area of the state. Encourage local governments to uh, exercise their full powers to administer the, and enforce the uniform code and provide for a uniform statewide approach for the training and qualification of personnel engaged in the administration and enforcement of the uniform code. And then going back down to B there, which is part of the legal memorandum again. Uh, this is just an excerpt of B of the administration and enforcement of the uniform code. The uniform code is typically enforced by the local level uh, or by each local government. Again, just highlighting that the township is responsible for enforcing these books. Um, so these are the implement, uh, implementation statistics um, of Monroe County, and this is obviously is in all the towns and city of in the county, but this is a good number of them. And on here, I made a little graph so you can uh, see the number of mentions of the Uniform Code in other municipalities: uh, Brighton, Gates, Greece, Henrietta, Ironicoy, Parma, Penfield, Pittsburgh, and Rochester. Uh, and I think the most that was mentioned was 20 times, and that was in Pittsburgh in their uh, Chapter 64 building construction and maintenance. Um, the town of Webster has it mentioned once or twice. We have it once in the fire prevention code, and I think maybe in the building section. I, I, I haven't found it, but I think it was. So what is the purpose of this presentation? Why am I here sitting and using my mouth? Um, if New York State requires mandatory enforcement of the uniform code, whether it's adopted into municipal or not, what is the purpose of my presentation? While the Town of Webster Municipal Code is currently without a property maintenance chapter. Although it's possible to cite violations out of the New York State Property Maintenance Code, which is that uh, small purple book on the top, very top, um, I can cite things out of that, um, violations of the, that code, uh, but without it adopted into municipal law, it creates some issues. The Town of Webster Property Maintenance Chapter would outline and enforce certain roles, enforcement roles, proper procedure, due process, actions in case of non-compliance, and penalties for offenses. So without this chapter, egregious non-compliant cases that are brought to court um, 
would not be able to be, um, we wouldn't have to find penalties for those actual violations. So myself and Josh came up with uh, a brief code layout that we think we should go into um, a draft for our town municipal law for the part of this chapter. Um, and on there, it's just a general provision section. It, it, it essentially looks like every other code section, or I'm sorry, chapter within our municipal law. It has to have a general provisions, there's regular regulatory provisions, and then there's enforcement and compliance. It's, it looks a lot like the fire, um, those three articles look a lot like the fire prevention chapter. But within those, the contents are specific to property maintenance. The other thing that is uh, important to note is that property maintenance isn't just exterior maintenance. It's not just brass. It's not just peeling paint. This is things that are inside your structural members from inside the building that's already already built, that's been starting to wear down, whether it's commercial or residential. It's about bathrooms and heating equipment and a lot of other things other than just grass and peeling paint or garbage left outside. So our proposed timeline um, would be March, we'd like to draft and develop a private maintenance chapter for public review. So I showed you briefly this. We have um, started already going through and actually going, putting all the verbiage into each one of those sections. Um, and then we would do an internal town legal review through our legal department, our town attorney and um, deputy town attorneys. In April, we'd like to release a drafted chapter um, for public review. And then we would propose a public hearing at uh, April 20th, 2023 town board meeting. And then in May, we bring before the town board for a formal vote on May 4th. And that concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Yes, Council. So, under interior property maintenance, okay, how do you propose getting into someone's house to do an inspection of their structural members, ceiling, walls, floors, etc.? It's a great question. So, it, it only applies to what I can see. Right? So I, I don't have any right to go in anyone's house without being invited. A lot of times that gets in, I get involved with that when I go into commercial properties or if I go into a residential property that's being rented out by a tenant will call me and say there's a problem within my house and come take a look at it. Even though the tenant is not the owner, you can enter the house with the tenant's permission. Okay. Exterior issues. you walk onto someone's property to their backyard if you have a complaint from a neighbor that there's all sorts of refuse in their backyard? It's a great question. So everyone is entitled to the fourth amendment right, which is the right to privacy. So yeah, the answer to your question is no, I can't walk onto someone's privacy or property. I can view it from a neighboring property if I'm given permission by the neighbor. And that's usually how I'm able to receive these violations. Generally speaking, the, the protections that are afforded um, all citizens under the, the fourth, uh, fourth Amendment uh, would apply to, to a town official, uh, even, even in the matter of this one, which is really kind of critical in nature. My, my question is the same as I had a leg up on this because I got to, you know, uh, to, to see this presentation a day or two ago, or at least I got to it. So I, I already know the answer to this. That when I saw the code layout and, you know, our three articles and 15 different subsections, I'd ask Jim and uh, Josh, when you populate that with your draft, how many pages is that going to be? And I think you said like 20? Yeah, I'll put 20 as I think it's what it is. So that, in essence, when you get to your implementation of the town code, you'll draft and develop this code, so it'll be 20, 25 pages. That's the one you'll hand over to get legal review. Correct. Yes. Okay. And would that ultimately, once it goes through legal review, would, would that be what we would be publishing in the newspaper and online in, in advance of the public hearing? That's a legal <laughs> question. Yes, I said okay. legal question. Well, no, this is this yeah. is actually more of a, a process question because the, 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 
in, in the past, what we've done is when a law has been proposed, we have a workshop session. So it would not be published until the town board had a chance to look at it and then make any revisions or amendments. Okay. And then, and then once it didn't pass that, then the town then it would be it would be published as a proposed law. And then there would be a public hearing. Yes, it'd be, it would be published for the purpose of the public. So based on the timeline um, that Josh and Jim provided, um, I guess what is it, Dolly? It's five five to ten days. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, so it would be the week before that. So we'd have to have this thing done. Probably workshop. Uh, I guess ideally, the workshop would be the last workshop in March, and if it needed to be uh, first workshop in April, would be the last time it would be looked at, and maybe tweaked. So then, then I mean, if, to keep uh, to keep on the timeline, then that's when. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's all really I had. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm Jones in the seat at 25 pages. I mean, John, some of the questions you just had, which are almost more 10,000 feet above, mm -hmm. I bet you'll have a lot more questions once you see that 25 pages. Mm -hmm. oh. I will. Mm -hmm. You will. You should. <laughs> I'm, I'm counting it. Anything else? Because uh, uh, you know, we'll talk about how we how do we get the workshop into that. Thanks. I like that. That board. Pardon. The other thing I think we need to discuss just very briefly is that I will be very interested to see the procedures in which how these things are handled because I, I think it's important for the public to know that that we're not looking to come down with an iron fist on this. There will be an opportunity for them probably at least three or four times to be noticed that there was a violation and an opportunity to to make that right and, and there will be several notices um, and we're not going to send you out in the car taking video of every single property um, but these are things that our residents do complain to us about even very often um, because they feel a little helpless when they live next door to some of these Let's face it, many of them are zombie properties. Uh, and I know that I have talked with many residents telling them that there already is a process on our website where you can fill in a complaint. Unfortunately, it's under abandoned homes. And then they say to me, but it's not abandoned. There's somebody living there. I was like, yes, I know, but there's still, there's still a, a little box in there where you can fill this out. So, uh, and I always guarantee that there's anonymity with that. We're not going to blow them in. I have no complaint. Um, but you know, people are concerned with several properties. They don't get all documented when you fill in the 20 pages, correct? Your process. Yeah, actually, uh, in Article 3, that's it's laid out. Mm -hmm. Action in case it's not yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. And that actually, uh, thank you, Judge, um, concludes the formal agenda tonight. I am, um, we will close down the cameras and all that because I am making a motion uh, to go into uh, executive session citing section 105, subchapter, I'm going to say A, apparently. That's matters that's in peril of public safety if disclosed. Um, well, it could be A, and I believe. Make an argument on D. I can uh, make an argument on H. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it covers a lot of them. Because yeah, so I would say yep. no, under 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 A, um, possibly A, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And um, I would like to invite to that uh, besides the board members, uh, the board members, town attorney Charlie Zessi and town finance director. Adams, that is my motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that is 8.56 p.m. And then Karen will take a, a just a good water or whatever. And um, last is, uh,
tying up things. And then we will uh, I'm let Karen go and we'll have to have to do that. Okay. I just got to use the rest of the